conversations. We want to inspire our students, we want to inspire our community to ask difficult questions, to challenge themselves, to think differently about the world. And today is really about that goal. We hope to exceed our standards of quality. Um, I think you're going to be delighted by the conversation that we have here today. And certainly it's something that is part of our strategic plan momentum too. In line with our strategic goals, we certainly want to create more opportunities to engage in inspiring conversations and to create knowledge. That's what universities are about, is to challenge our minds, to open our minds, to think critically about issues, to listen to other perspectives, and perhaps, just perhaps, to learn a lot of information. As we prepare to launch our $100 million campaign associated with Momentum, philanthropy is the key to helping us achieve some of these goals. And that's why I'm so grateful for people like Brat and Swati Bizet. Brat is a member of Adelphi's class, MBA class of 1978. Got to put my glasses on for that one, Brat. Brat funded this event uh, through his Bizet Global Understanding Project and we have a new incredible initiative that explores the issues of globalization and colonialism. I'm very excited about the work that we're starting here on this campus that's going to be university-wide. We truly have an interdisciplinary approach to understanding globalization and tackling tough issues like colonialism. The project supports faculty research, our student experiences abroad. Every January, we take eight students to India. It's going to be involved in curriculum development, additional events uh, like today, and more. So thank you so much to the Bizet family for their generosity. So I'm excited to bring Bharat on stage to share with you a little bit more about his passion for involvement here at Adelphi. Thank you for everything you do to support our students and for representing Adelphi's vision for the future and helping us achieve our strategic goals. Please join me in a warm welcome for Barat Bizet. Thank you, Dr. Reardon. Welcome, Caroline Elkins, wherever you are. I don't see you here. And good afternoon, Adelphi. About two years ago, we embarked on a journey that had a singular goal, which was to reverse the reversal of globalization, a goal that remains front and center today. Along the way, we tried to identify some of the causes of why we are where we are and the challenges that we face and other problems that exist no matter where you sit on the political, social, economic spectrum. What's critical is that most of us seriously doubt the veracity of what we see and we read in the news every day. For most of the 20th century, America has been the leader in establishing the rule of law-based order. This has been because it promoted open borders, free trade, and most important, reward for hard work. I know this from personal experience. I came to America and Adelphi in 1976 and found here at, at Adelphi virtually unlimited opportunity and extremely good fortune. But, very sadly, in the America of today, this is no longer true. The world, not just America, is divided in multiple wars of different kinds, shooting wars as we are seeing in Ukraine and Gaza, cyber wars, data wars, propaganda wars, financial wars, and other unconventional attacks. At Adelphi, we would like to ask why this happened. One reason is that some political, religious, business leaders are able to get better control when the world is divided. But what divides people? Differences divide people, not similarity. Differences, cultural differences, economic differences, social differences, religious differences. These differences are very easy to be played up by the media 
when today the vast majority of media is focused on profits versus truth, which has led to the decline of ethics and of moral compass. How can we, especially the young, here at Adelphi, do something to help America overcome this? Unless we see ourselves and feel ourselves somebody else's culture or background, it's very difficult to argue against the bombardment of inflammatory stereotypes that is fed to us by biased media. My personal experience when living in three continents has been that going a little bit outside your comfort zone is a great way to understanding the world. Going a little bit, finding different ways of achieving the same objective is a great way of understanding the world. I have learned more from very poor people as opposed to very wealthy people, the expression necessity is the mother of invention, I sort of translate into deprivation and hunger are the prerequisites of success. We should know the real facts, the real truth about the history of our civilization. If we want to understand where we're going, we need to know who we are and where we've been. We will support in this program not only academic and business collaborations between the United States and other countries, but also research important parts of history and background that, shall we say, have been marginalized in the last few decades. We want to study different subjects, like the economics of slavery, drug trading by governments, trade routes and the impact on culture, different definitions of corruption, and even subjects like genocide. Today is the first in our Global Understanding Lecture Series, and I'm delighted that someone of the stature of Professor Elkins is going to be addressing Adelphi today. She has done an extraordinary job in all of her books superbly researched, and is an encyclopedic source of information. I won't go too much into her resume, as my friend Anne Mangai is going to do that. Anne, over to you, and thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for the lecture today, Dr. Joanne Corbin, the Dean of Social, School of Social Work. One of her areas of scholarship addresses the mental need of communities in several countries in Africa. She spent 14 years examining the effects of armed conflicts and displacement of children, families, and communities in northern Uganda. Her focus was on children and adolescents who were abducted during the fight in the conflict of the Lord's resistant army. She studied the social, cultural, and economic uh, disruptions of families and communities as a result of this 20-year armed uh, conflict. And she developed community-based interventions to begin the work of restoration. She also worked in Tanzania, and her research, which she conducted in Tanzania, was a feasibility study of workplace and mental health needs. And she has a book, Children and Families Affected by Armed Conflict in Africa, Implications and Strategies for Helping Professionals in the United States. Our guest speaker today is Dr. Caroline Elkins, who is a professor of history and of African and African American studies at Harvard University and the founding director of Harvard Center for African Studies. In her first book, Imperial Reckoning, The Untold Story of Britain's Gulag in Kenya, 
was awarded the 2006 Pulitzer Prize for General Nonfiction. Her other book, Legacy of Violence, A History of the British Empire, was a finalist for the Bailey Gifford Prize, selected by the New York Times as some of the notable 100 books of 2022, and chosen by the BBC, Waterstone, and History Today as a book of the year for 2022. She is a contributor to the New York Times, Book Review, The Guardian, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, and The New Republic. She has appeared on numerous radio and television programs, including NPR's All Things Considered and BBC The World. At Harvard, Dr. Elkins was selected twice as Water Channing Cabot Fellow, elected as a member of the Faculty Council for Arts and Sciences, and inducted as an honorary, an honorary member of the university's Pi Beta Kappa chapter. She has also held numerous other fellowships and awards, including from the Guggenheim Foundation, the American Council of Learned Scholars, Fulbright, the Social Sciences Research Council, the Mellon Foundation, the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, and the Rockefeller Center. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Drs. Caroline Elkins and Dr. Joanne Corbin to the stage and with the Kenyan Karibu. Good afternoon, everyone. It's good to be here. Dr. Elkins, welcome. It's wonderful to have you with us and to be able to share some time with you this afternoon. Uh, your work is significant in its scope and its breadth, and you have really painted the arc of imperialism and looked at specific occurrences. Would you start by giving us an overview as to where this is, how you started? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Joanne, so very much uh, for that, and I will. But first, I have to say some very generous words of thanks to Mr. Bizet, for your generosity in bringing me here to all of my new friends uh, here at Adelphi. Monimu, mimini fraha kabisa ku hapaleo, asante sana. My Kenyan friend, we have to have a little bit of uh, a little bit of Kiswahili, and to all of you for taking time out of what are you? You have all sorts of options on a busy day like today, um, and I'm very, very grateful to spend this time with you. Um, and to be engaged in a generative conversation, as Mr. Bizet said, thinking about um, our world and our, the place in which we're living. And I think that's a, a good place for us to start. And I'd like to start out with this big picture and thinking about, you know, how did we get to where we are today? Um, in what ways, as an historian, if I don't ask this question, I'm out of a job, right? In what ways does the past inform the present? Um, how do we seek out and find evidence not to, to judge the past? to create a kind of balance sheet of what was good, what was bad, and at the end you tally it all up, but to ask the question of how and why did events and processes unfold, right? How and why did people in the past make certain choices that landed us where we are today? And I think there are all kinds of time periods and events that historians can focus on, but I've always been interested in big scale. Right? In other words, if I mine the past for processes and institutions that have had a, a huge role in shaping the world in which we're living, empires are the place that I would start. And when we think about it, 100 years ago, much of the world outside of the United States and Western Europe was under colonial rule of one form or another. And if we stretch even further back, we find that the United States and Latin America, much of the world that wasn't yet Western Europe, had been under European imperial or colonial rule in one form or another. And then if we even look to the East, right, and we, we similarly see a pattern of imperial rule with the Japanese in the interwar period occupying various parts of Asia and looking to the West, particularly the British Empire, as a model for their own empire. Now, 
before we go any further, I think it's pretty helpful to kind of, I, do, I always like to do some table setting, right? So let's put it on the table of what do I mean by colonial or imperial rule? Well, imperialism is, in, in, in sort of my mind, is the extension of economic and political control over foreign lands through either informal or formal means. Now, importantly, I use the terms imperialism, colonialism rather interchangeably, but though it's important to bear in mind that most nations much preferred informal imperialism. Having colonies, taking sovereignty from somewhere else, setting up shop in a foreign land is expensive business. And it really wasn't until sort of various geopolitical factors were at play that many of the European nations began establishing what were sort of, you know, the formal colonial rule. Rather, they'd much rather keep it open by informal means, the strength of their free trade in particular, keeping the doors open. That's why we sometimes will hear that Argentina, for example, in the 19th century was an informal colony of Britain. Britain never formally colonized it, but through an economic standpoint, it had informal imperial control. Now, getting back to scale and impact, the empire that had, in my mind, the largest impact on the world as we know it today was the British Empire, right? At its height in the 20th century, it embodied nearly a third of the world's landmass, about 700 million colonial subjects. And what's important is that Britons at the time and all the way down to the present day for many Britons, understood their empire to be exceptional. Somehow or another, Britain got empire right. With this kind of benign imperial, which I'll talk about in a moment. And it's this notion of exceptionalism that really sort of, you know, sort of continues down all the way to the present day. And I think that that ex notion of exceptionalism, the ways in which empire, you just have to think about empire to think about Brexit, right? The ways in which empire still so, so dramatically influence political, social, and economic choices. And I think that kind of sort of saliency of empire demands some explanation. And it also demands explanation in terms of the impact that this empire had on a third of the world's empire. Now, if we step back in the beginning of the 19th century, uh, when Britain was on its, its march to sort of amass this world's largest empire, there's sort of two main ideas or frameworks that were animating Britain's expansion. And I want to sort of lay those out for us, again, getting back to sort of the, some of the table setting. And the first is, I bet you you could sit there and guess at least one of them, all of you sitting there. Well, the first one is capital, right? And here we have financiers and traders who are on the cutting edge of opening up empires what were called chartered companies in particular. And these were monopolies, right, or exclusive trading and economic rights that were granted by the British monarchy or the crown in return for fulfilling all kinds of obligations for the state. So private companies were actually doing the bidding of the state. They had their own armies, they had their own, po anybody collect postage stamps, they're among the collectors, big things nowadays, currencies, laws, and there are many, many of them, the most famous of which and the biggest of which was the East India Company, which we'll come back to, but there was also many others, right? We've got the Royal Niger Company, the Royal African Company, um, and many scholars writing about colonial capitalism see its spread and facilitation as being based on coercion, right? Extremely violent measures. And for them, the history of the British Empire was absolutely inseparable from Britain's economy, particularly with the advent of the Industrial Revolution, right? With demands for raw materials and cheap laborers, uh, and the extraction of these elements were just voracious in the empire. And so what we see is this kind of rise of this new global industrial order brought harsh labor regimes, particularly in mines and plantations, right? And we can think of sugar plantations in the Caribbean. We can think of mines like those in South Africa where diamonds and the world's largest gold supply are being discovered in the 19th century. And this sort of unremitting extraction of economic and social value from non-white workers is something that's known as racial capital, right? And so it's often explained today that not only was capitalism a pillar of empire, but it was a particular form of capital. It was a racial capitalism where it's almost like a zero-sum game. Those, the extraction of resources and labor is what really allowed Europe and the Western world to take off. But there's another concept, um, or a second one that I want to sort of discuss in our cable, table setting alongside capitalism, um, and that's liberalism. And more specifically, when I think about liberalism and empire, I think about liberal imperialism. Now, just briefly, for those of you who will do a quick sort of tour of what would be a, like a five-semester course if you were an undergraduate on what liberalism is, 
but it was fiercely debated in the 20th century. And while it was hotly contested, um, its pillars rested on really sort of a more just and equitable society, the protection of property rights, free trade, and most importantly, probably one of the most fundamental elements of liberalism is the rule of law, right? That law, that there's a rule of law, the enforcement of law, and through various reform acts in Britain, that really allowed for the extension of the franchise to more and more people beyond just white property men, liberalism was understood to be a universalist concept, right? That it would be spread throughout the world. And of course, liberalism is in part the bedrock for our own democracy here in the United States. But when this notion of greater equality, right, begins, so this notion of universalism, it begins to wither when Britain deals with its empire. When liberalism washes up on distant shores, like these in the, say, the Indian subcontinent or Africa and elsewhere, and confronted dis, you know, distant places and what are considered backward people, bound by what were strange religions and hierarchies and sentimental and dependent relationships, Britain viewed their imperial center or their metropole as being culturally distinct from the empire or its colonial periphery. And what becomes the marker of difference is skin color. Whites were at one end of the civilization spectrum, blacks on the other, and all the shades of humanity somewhere in between. So what we see happening is that race begins to set the terms for rationality and irrationality, civilized and uncivilized. And it's important to bear in mind that there's also something which we would call sort of racialization, such that when when Britain extended colonial rule over, say, the Irish or the Afrikaners in South Africa, they, they did what we call, they racialized white populations, equating their cultures to those of brown and black subjects and using similar dehumanizing language. So there's always this idea, it's not just about civilizing the, the Kosa in South Africa or the, the Malay in Malay, on, on what was Malaya at that time, but it's also civilizing the Irish and the Afrikaners and later the, 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 what is considered the Jewish race, race in Palestine. Now, so what we're seeing then is that liberalism and imperialism are sort of being born together at the same time in Britain in the 19th century. They're co-mingling with one another. And so what we have is that this kind of contested but coherent ideology emerging that integrates, on the one hand, Britain's claims to all these different territories around the world, alongside a massive undertaking to reform imperial subjects and shepherd them into the modern world. And in the mid-19th century, this liberal imperialism found even further expression from scientific racism's evolutionary model, right? And that developmentalism cleaves to these kind of racial hierarchies that liken colonial subjects to children who needed paternalistic guidance to reach a kind of full maturity. And I'm saying all this in the language of the time, right? And like these so-called children, empire's barbarians, as they were sometimes called, were thought to be sort of malleable, right? And it was thought that British rule would eventually render these subject populations rational, respectful of law and order, prepared to participate in the modern world. And the civilizing mission, of course, would take decades, if not centuries, to carry out, and it was Britain's role, its responsibility for humanity's sake. It was its moral duty to carry this out. And what the famed poet of empire, who some of you may be familiar with, Rudyard Kipling, called the white man's bird. Okay? But there's always a big but if you're in a story. And I had to get you somewhere, right? So we've table set on some. But if the civilizing mission was also reformist in its claims, it was brutal nonetheless. And violence wasn't just the British Empire's midwife, in other words, wars of conquest. It was endemic in the systems and structures of British colonial rule. And in some ways, if you sit and think about it for a minute, how could it have been otherwise? Britain was claiming sovereignty or the right to rule over vast swaths of people who hadn't conceded to Britain's colonial claims to taking of their territory. But the colonial state, like all states, had a monopoly on what's considered legitimate violence. That is, it could unleash violence legitimately in the state's eyes against anyone who contested the right to rule. And moreover, those who were contesting the right to rule were considered to be enacting illegitimate violence, right? 
And also importantly, Britain's use of widespread violence was not haphazard. Rather, it was enacted, getting back to remember the point I just made about the rule of law, enacted through hundreds, if not thousands, of laws. So for example, if a security force came in, I'll, I'll give you some examples in a moment, came in and leveled, detained without trial, used various forms of, 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 of violence, ground down villages, if there were not laws enabling that, local colonial authorities would typically pass laws ex post facto to render those behaviors legal. And ultimately what we see happening is that over and over again, what we think of as martial law gets replaced by statutory martial law. Hundreds and hundreds of pages of what are considered to be emergency regulations when the state's ordinary laws could not contain the challenges to the state coming from indigenous population. Is what you would think of, or probably have heard before, as a state of emergency, a police state. Okay. And the important part with this, when we think about it, if we connect these dots, repression was much more than just, just reestablishing or establishing British authority. When challenged by colonial subjects through small scale protests, union strikes, or full blown rebellion. Violence was enacted on everything. Minds, bodies, souls, landscapes, communities, histories. And it was intimately connected to the civilizing mission's developmentalist dogma. Now, what do I mean by that? In other words, it wasn't just the structure of colonial rule that shaped systems and practices. And nor was it just capitalism, right? Going back to the extract extractive labor uh, principles in the plantations and mines, where they were trying to sort of squeeze out as much profit as they could. Rather, it was liberal imperialism's ideology as well, which enacted violence while promising freedom, equality, a seat at the table of the modern world. It oftentimes cast nationalists and freedom fighters not just as criminal, but as terrorists, barely clinging to the lowest rung of humanity. But of course, coercion would subdue and domesticate them. Now, what do I, again, what do I mean by that? Just like, let's use one analogy. Just like Victorian era parents disciplined their prog progeny, recalcitrant sort of childlike natives in the empire also had to be punished. And a kind of perversion of Proverb 1324, for those of you familiar with the Bible, spare the rod, spoil the child, colonial officials wanted to, and the security forces wanted to see their infantilized subjects. They wanted to see them see and feel their own suffering. They wanted to know that it was purposeful. And they had a term for this. It was called the moral effect of violence. And you see that term recurring over and over again, from India to Palestine to Malaya to Kenya, the fact that this violence not only was reinstilling the authority of the state, but it had a kind of reformist quality. That's how you could explain the extraordinary levels of violence that was taking on. And so if you, when you see this, liberal imperialism is kind of this oxymoron, right? It's in contradiction to, so we have reform and coercion being two sides of the same coin. And it's what makes charges of violence so difficult to stick in the empire, not to mention the fact about evidence, which I'm gonna talk about in a second. Evidence becomes a problem because Britain's really good at getting rid of it. But even at the time, liberalism has a capacity to continue to reform itself around these things. And what we see happening, and, and so even at the time, great towering thinkers, and those of you who are sort of, ner if there are any nerds in the audience like me, I used to read under the cover with the flashlight, right? And things like John Stuart Mill, and he couldn't make sense of these things. But you know who could? The humanists. Anybody know Robert Louis Stevenson, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? Hands up, who knows that? That's about empire. You can't be, either. man is both at once. And so the humanists can contain the dualisms in a way that great thinkers and even politicians can't. That we all have the capacity, states have the capacity, empires have the capacity to be both reformist and violent at the same time. Okay. Now, a few sort of, what have I got, five minutes? So a, few, a few words about sort of these development notions, developmentalist notions, extend well. I gave you the example of Britain. I could have been having a conversation with you about the French Empire. I just actually, I get paid to talk about the British Empire. I know a little bit about the French, but let's stick with the British. But the other thing that is these become encoded in international treaties and laws. So for example, 
The First World War, the German and Ottoman empires are divided up by the League of Nations, and they're classified A, B, and C. By the way, notice that, A, B, and C. A, B, and C denoted the developmentalist place that these different art areas of the world were on the spectrum of humanity. A mandates were places like Palestine, they were viewed to maybe be a century before independence. B mandates somewhere in between. C mandates like Cameroon, never. They were so backward, right? But the idea again was that the, that the perceived scale of humanity were for, for populations not yet ready to stand on their own. Now think about it for a minute. That term not yet ready to stand on their own. That term had been used when Africa was divided up at the Congress of Berlin in 1884 and 1885 for areas of the world not yet ready to stand on their own. Fast forward, those same terms are not just encoded in the Treaty of Versailles and the League of Nations uh, Charter. They're used at the UN conference in 1945 for non-self-governing territories not yet ready to stand on their own. And the arbiter of when yet arrives are, of course, the colonizing nation. So my question to you is, when does yet arrive? It never arrives. Because in effect, you have to give up the sovereign claims over your empire and concede that the civilizing mission has been correct, has been effective. Now eventually, in the, four, in the 50s and 60s in particular, we have war after war after war. If anybody follows the monarchy, I have to convince. Anybody watch The Crown? Oh, come on, hands up, don't be shy. I watch it, I do it for research. That's what I tell myself. So, if you watch The Crown, it's peppered with all of this, right? The first 30 years that Queen Elizabeth sat on the throne, there was never a year without a violent war in the empire. Not one. In many years, there were more than one. Recently, as Malimu knows, King Charles, his first visit to the, to, to the common, current Commonwealth was to Kenya, right? And the Commonwealth becomes the perfect coda to what's considered a successful empire. And when speaking of the Commonwealth, even to this present day, when Queen Elizabeth passed away, I had to write some pieces about this, and King Charles is talking about the Commonwealth. He uses the language of fictive kinship. The family of Commonwealth nations tell that to many people in the Commonwealth. They probably won't agree. And he talks about how they grew up under his mother, quote unquote, these nations. Now, finally, let me just give you a couple of examples if we move around the empire. See if we can discern some of these patterns, right? If we look at India to begin with, right? As I mentioned before, the initial period of colonization happens in 1600, the very first chartered company, the East India Company. And it rules by proxy for the crown. And it made its wealth through plunder and taxation, largely policies that witnessed the start of recurring famines throughout the region. And of course, it's important to point out when the East India Company comes along, India is hardly a backwater. Culturally and economically, it was prosperous civilization that had existed for millennia. Some factoids for you. Oldest university system in the world. Originated our numerical system. Produced towering philosophers and thinkers. Gave the world Buddhism. Hinduism birthed the more tolerant, pluralistic version of Islam. I could go on and on. By the mid-19th century, the corruption, violence, and plunder under the East African, pardon me, under the East India Company um, led to the eruption of violence in 1857 of the mutiny and the crown effectively taking over what becomes um, the British Raj. But still, it's during this period of the Raj that we see these images, this idea of Indians toddling, that word was used often, toddling behind British colonial administrators. And of course, often, and many of you know this narrative, we can talk about it in discussion, the Indian National Congress, with Nehru and Gandhi, who you well know, um, pursue a policy of nonviolent protest against colonial rule, and the British government comes down, the Raj cracks down with extraordinary acts of violence, all of which are lawful. And we could, I could sit here and go through them. I took me about eight, if you don't like the book, it's a great door stomper. It took me 850 pages to go through this, but the important point is that these are all legal, right? And by the time India achieves its independence in 1947, which, by the way, was hardly foreordained, the country is divided between Pakistan and, and, and India, with Britain doing very little to stem the violence that partitioned, violence that had engendered through centuries of divide and rule policies, leading to the deaths of millions and the dislocation of about 15 million people. Importantly, 
at the time of decolonization, they also begin a process that unfolds over time and space and empire of burning the document. At the Red Fort, which some of you know who are familiar with India, very famous site, both for imprisonment, it's where they conducted massive bonfires, getting rid of the, the, the evidence. And for those of you who also know this period of time, there's a very famous picture of Nehru and Lord and Lady uh, Mountbatten, the last viceroy of, of, of uh, India, and his wife. Does anybody know that picture? The three of them are standing there, and it's a, it's a cloudy day. But I came across a document, some, some documents, you know, this document I found in the Nigeria files, where it says that the, they were, it was such a haphazard process. Has anybody ever tried to burn, burn a lot of paper at once in the, in the fireplace? It's a mess, right? It doesn't burn all the way through. It shoots up the flue. It starts fires outside. It's a mess. And it's talking about the fact that the bonfires at Red Fort were threatening to in, interrupt Independence Day ceremonies. So I thought, hmm, good thing for Google. I start going back and looking and sort of trying to find, it was a sunny day, the day of independence. That fog, that, that haze that's behind them is the ash and fragments of the documents that Britain is burning as it's retreating from India in an effort to control the narrative. If we move to Kenya, we see a similar thing. Colonized later at the end of the 19th century, the Congress of Berlin that we just talked about a moment ago, it was a settler-based colony where they alienated land from local populations under 999-year leases. And then many of those who had their own land alienated were forced, much like they had been in India, into the wage economy through taxation. British officials taxed everything. Wives, wives huts, taxes, uh, uh, windows, dogs, bicycles, everything, to force people into the wage economy in order to pay the tax. Ultimately, we see in this instance, a continuation of colonial rule and this idea, many, many of those in Kenya, much like India, which was the backbone of, the, of one of the reasons why the Allies win the Second World War, 2.5 million Indians participate in the Indian Army. Similarly, Africans uh, throughout the continent, particularly in the Carrier Corps, they come back to Kenya anticipating some semblance of what the Atlantic Charter ostensibly promised them, self-determination which did not come. Instead, what we find after the second period of the Second World War, this actually becomes one of the most economically exploitative periods of time of the British Empire, in large part because Britain exits the war an absolute financial disaster. Keynes calls it financial Armageddon. It was so close to bankruptcy. And they look at their empire. They look at the rise of the United States and the Soviet Union as the big three. And they made the long bet through a policy called imperial resurgence, pumping money into the colonies to extract more money out, denying self-determination. So this whole idea that post-World War II, we see this sort of gradual sort of beneficence of, 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 of a move towards decolonization is actually a misnomer. It's incorrect. It's what the official narrative would wish you to believe. So in the case of Kenya, for example, when I come in years ago, and start looking at this, we knew that a few people had been detained, but much of the files, like India, had been destroyed. And we'll talk about some of this in our conversation. But what we learn is that the, the Kenyans rise up in revolt, something called the Mau Mau Emergency, demanding Githaka Nawiyadi, land and freedom. And in response, the British response is draconian. It detains nearly the entire Kikuyu population of 1.5 million people, of course, in violation of all kinds of international laws. That, have, that are being passed at the time, and commit horrendous acts of forced labor, torture, and the like. And my work with this, that project was to establish when official files are destroyed in a large scale, you have to establish that something actually happened, that something is an historical fact. Now, if we look in another area, geography, let's move. We've gone from the Indian subcontinent. We'll go now to, from Africa to the Middle East, to Palestine the last area that was officially coming under British rule, and it came under British rule, as I mentioned before, as a, as, as a League of Nations mandate. Now, one of the challenges in this region, again, when we get back to thinking about these sort of divide and rule processes, and I'll comment just briefly on it, which is, in effect, Britain comes in around the period of the First World War, and they try to shore up Arab support for the war. And there's a series of letters between High Commissioner of Egypt, 
perfect man and the Sharif of Mecca. And in those correspondences back and forth, called the, the very famous, the McMahon letters, 10 of them, Britain promises in return for Arab support during the war, the area that is at that point under Ottoman control, Palestine, as part of a larger territory that would be under complete Arab rule under the Sharif of Mecca. And then, a few years later, Britain issues the Balfour Declaration. And in the Balfour Declaration, they decide by 1917, what's called by, at that point, uh, David Lloyd George, the Prime Minister, the contract with Jewry, as he calls it. That the idea was that at this point in the war, they needed to shore up Jewish support. They're convinced that this needs to be done. They get the green light from the Americans. And in the Balfour Declaration, they promise Palestine as a Jewish national home. So in effect, when we look at this, getting back to, and I'll sort of, I won't belabor the point, we can go through some of it. But we see from 1922, when this becomes an official League of Nations mandate, to the time of the end of the British occupation under the mandate in 1948, a flip-flopping back and forth, depending upon, as one British colonial official put it to me, or uh, in an interview at the time, he said, I don't really care about politics. I'm not, I don't care about the Arabs or the Jews. I'm merely pro, I am merely pro-British, he says. And what we see is a consistent going back and forth to the detriment of both populations, of promising this territory, but also passing a series of laws and also enacting a series of violence. So we see that erupting in the late 1930s during the Arab Revolt. And then we see this again happening at the end of mandate, beginning in 1944 when Menachem Begin declares war against uh, the British as, part, as the leader of the Irgun. And we see the Zionist uprising. And again, an unleashing of incredible violence by the British. And ultimately, the Zionist uprising is actually the single, the only successful insurgency against the British colonial forces in the history of 20th century empire. Under Menachem Begin, Yitzhak Shamir, and um, David Ben-Gurion. And all of them eventually become one, two, three in terms of prime ministers of the, the independent state of Israel. And my point with this is, of course, once again, you can imagine when Britain decolonizes, they do what? They, yes, I've got somebody here, I'm mouthing it, they burn the files. So what can we say, just in terms of sort of wrapping up some initial thoughts? You know, when we look at this, when I think of legacies, I think of legacies in a variety of ways. I think of legacies in terms of the succession of laws, beginning in the late 19th, early 20th century with the South African War, all the way through, to the, all the way through Northern Ireland in the 1970s. We see the passage of these emergency regulations becoming more restrictive, more encompassing over time from place to place to place. And these same set laws, if you look at states today, whether it's, and I enlisted them all, whether it's India, whether it's Kenya, whether it's the present state of Israel, elsewhere, these same laws, these same emergency regulations are being used today on the books, they were left behind by the British, to quash dissent. The second of which is thinking about local conflicts. As I've gestured a few times before, divide and rule policies were, were, were part and parcel of the British Empire. You didn't want your Kikuyu and your Maasai to recognize that actually the person they were sort of most worried about were their colonizer. So you created all kinds of policies that physically divided them from each other and provided pluses and minuses, benefits and, and things that you took away, depending upon who was supporting you. And we see many of these areas of the world if we go back to Palestine, we look at the Western Wall. The first time we see any violence around the Western Wall is under British colonial rule. Prior to that, there was a flexible understanding by those who considered themselves to be descendants of the Hebrews, those who considered themselves to be Arab, in terms of access to the Western Wall. And I could go through a variety of different areas as well. And finally, in terms of demands that are coming from around the world, Demands for a kind of global reckoning, a colonial reckoning. And I would encourage us to think about it in a few ways. And one of which is, there is a very famous literary figure named Wole Shoyinka from Nigeria. And many years ago, a student's here, believe me, it was a long time, before you were even born, when I was first a graduate student, he came and he gave a lecture at Harvard. And there's a, around the question of the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, that was just starting there. And he was so prescient. And he said, there's a problem with this. 
there's a problem with this process because we have to think about the moral and material links to reconciliation. And what he meant by that was that individuals in the apartheid uh, government could go in front of the TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Co Commission, and tell of the most horrific crimes that they committed. But they didn't have to do what? Anybody know? What didn't they have to do to be absolved? Back there. I can't hear you, but I'm sure you're saying they didn't have to apologize. They didn't have to apologize. So in the, in, in the apology, there's all kinds of things that we can unpack together. And the other is the material link. Recompense. None of that had to be given either. And so the question arises, I had some wonderful questions that were brought to us in terms of, uh, before I came in, the, one of the questions was thinking about sort of what's next if we have a comma after all of this. I think there's some of that, but there's also the question about what is the role of current states, what is the role of civil society, and what is the role of private sector and business. In many of the places of these worlds that I've just laid out, what we're seeing is that development, reform, a whole range of things outside of the colonial system are taking place through private sector, entrepreneurship. States are continued to be quite weak, not in all, but many parts of the post-colonial world. And when you think of weak states, I want you to think about authoritarian states are actually weak states. They're dependent upon violence for their rule, right? They're dependent upon these kinds of sort of big systems of laws that deprive people of, of, of a lot of the ideals of, of liberalism. And so the question becomes, who can step into the breach with all of this? And we're seeing more and more of that happening. I'm going to pause here because I know we've got lots to talk about, but I think, um, I think most of all, I think understanding, and I hope I, I, I sort of drove some of these points home, the complexities of this, to try to get to a bottom line balance sheet of adding it all up at the end is not helpful to anyone because history doesn't repeat itself as much as you've been told that. Patterns repeat themselves. And one of my jobs is to look for patterns and then to understand how can we intervene to shift these patterns. And that's one of the things that I'm very hopeful of based on my experience this morning with the most extraordinary young group of young people, some of them are sitting over here, um, that our hope is with them to be thinking about how do, we, how do we critically understand and discern these patterns so that the, the world in which they are living looks different from the one in which we're living today. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Elkins. That was, that was extraordinary. I'd like to pick up with where you had ended up. And you've painted this arc of history and looked at patterns. Why is it important that we look back at the historical patterns? And these aren't isolated. There's a connectivity. There's a pattern. There's a deliberateness and a systematized nature of this. Why is it important that we look at that for now? What is it, where's the resonance for our time today? Thank you for that, Joanne. And I think I, I gestured to it a little bit, but I think some of this is when we think about these patterns. You know, we hear about all these words today. Disruption, that's one of the buzzwords out there. I, when, I, when all else fails, I say disruption on certain things and it seems to gain some courage. But my point is, is that if we're able to discern these patterns, if we, especially with you know, leading thinkers, but also I keep coming back to this, the, the young people of today, they're the lifeblood of change, right? And so what I hope is that they can look at this and discern these patterns. Right? Discern the patterns of how, and as I, I, I laid out, that discern patterns not just of capitalism, but the ways in which violence can adhere into liberalism. That we often hear, you know, when describing sort of when we feel like democracy is going off the rails, that it's, it's fascist. Actually, what should terrify us is that it's adhering to the liberal project. That there are elements within liberalism that allow for this kind of violence to take place that allow for this concept of not yet being there, that allow for a liberal state to unleash its violence against its subjects, often whom are brown or black or non-white or not part of a particular class in society. So my hope in discerning these patterns is for young people to be critical of this, to understand why this is happening. And when we think about change, the demanding of change, you know, oftentimes we think about these sort of violent revolutions, but a lot, more often than not, they come from people who are challenging the status quo of how we think about it. And to me, that's sort of one of, the, one of the elements that I hope in terms of discerning some of these patterns.
many remarkable things as I you know, read your book. And one of them is the enduring power of imperialism, even in the face of many of the abuses. And you talk about your court here, the trial, and there are still advocates for imperialism. Can you speak to that enduring, that commitment? Right, right. So let me, let me step back a little bit on that one. So my, I, I mentioned in, in some of my remarks, my, my first book, which Mang Limu uh, kindly mentioned in, in her remarks, was a book called Imperial Reckoning, which was this book that I went in and I was, look, I was a step back. I was this poor kid from New Jersey <laughs> who um, I played soccer, I had my choices between all kinds of things, and I ultimately decided that, and I was kind of this nerd, and I ended up going to, to Princeton as an undergraduate, and the beautiful thing about that school was that they, and they, they funded young people to do research in the summertime. Not only did they fund it, but they provided the funds for what I would have made if I'd been working. There's no way I could afford to go do research in the rest of the summertime. Somebody didn't pay for the summer job that I was supposed to have. And I began, I was doing work on, my advisor at that point was uh, an African, somebody who worked on Africa, Penny in particular, and I came across this period called the Mau Mau Emergency, and we'll probably get to the point on this. But the, the, I got to uh, the archives in Kenya as a senior in college, and there were some documents referring to this, these things called detention camps. And I, like a good undergraduate, I looked around to see if anybody had written, and nobody had. And I really knew I wanted to be an academic. But I also knew I had a mountain of debt. And so I took a right-hand turn. I went to Wall Street. <laughs> I'm a recovering investment banker um, for a few years. And I went back to academia, and I chased this down. This question, this burning question that I had about these camps. How is this possible? And I think also for young people today, like, chase your burning questions that animate, that keep you. It kept me up at night. And when I really started digging at this, what I realized is that so many of the documents were missing. And we had sort of, you know, we had some firsthand evidence. We had the original archivist in Kenya who said, you know, yeah, entire departments are missing. So we, we kind of knew the scale of the documents. So I figured all kinds of ways to get this. Done. And because what happened was is that at the time the narrative was, the official narrative, yes, a few terrible things happened, but they were all one-offs. Bad apples rogue actors in the colonial administration. And you have to remember, the security forces were fighting these terrible savages, these Mau Mau. And look at what we did. We civilized Kenya, and now they're part of the Commonwealth, and we're one big happy family, right? So I decide, and so what happens is that particular book had to establish that this was fact. That it was fact that all these people went through these camps, that this torture took place, so I did all kinds, I did hundreds of interviews, I archives all over the world, trying to piece these fragments back together again. When I, the book was released in 2005, it was resoundingly criticized. I shouldn't be sitting here. I really shouldn't. If, and maybe if social media was happening at the time, I probably would have really been done. Because I was a junior faculty member at the time, and, and you know, reports of what senior faculty say about us matter for everything. And, and um, I had a senior faculty member who tried to console me. Caroline, don't worry. Historical revisionism goes through three phases. The first of which tells you that um, you're wrong. The second of which tells you, oh, we knew that already. And then the third of which tells you that actually you're accepted into the canon. You're now kind of the bedrock of what's considered. And he said, you hope you live to see the second phase. And you know what, what ended up if you will, sort of saving my career. I, I won some prizes for the book, so that was helpful. But what really ended up saving my career was the fact that I am like on the ropes professionally, and I get a phone call from a human rights law firm called Lee Day in Kenya. And they say to me that they want to sue. And they want to sue the British government on behalf of claimants in Kenya who had survived these camps, and they can't file this case unless I agree to sign on as the expert witness, and imperial reckoning is going to be the basis of the case. The day before, I'd been sat down by my department chair and said, if you have any chance of getting tenure, stop all this foolishness of this stuff out there, advocating for rights and the rest of it. Put your head down, be a real academic, and for God's sake, stop talking on CNN. You're too young to be a public intellectual, blah, 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 blah. Next day, I get this thing. And of course, this is, again, speaking to young people. I thought about it for about a, a hot minute. 
and said, absolutely, I'll sign up. Because, in some, but because for me, when I was doing this research, particularly interviewing the, the, the hundreds of, of detainees, none of them asked for anything from me, except for one thing, which was what? That people, exactly, that people knew what happened to them. And so in the context of this case, it's filed in the High Court of London, 2009. And when the case is filed, the response by the British government, they try to strike it out twice. Legal technicality. Once based on, on uh, state succession, they said that Kenya actually had inherit, should inherit all the claims at independence, all liability transferred to the independent state of Kenya. So whether this happened or not, wrong venue, you need to be in Nairobi. You should be suing the Kenyan government for the stuff that we perpetrated. And if that didn't fly, then they said that statute of limitations has long been exceeded. This was a big, this was a tort claim. Statute of limitations was typically three years. We were asking for a 50-year wave of limitation. But most importantly, many people in the government and in the press said these claimants were liars. They were making it up. Now I'll get to the quick punchline, which is kind of fun. Can we giggle about that just a little bit? Okay. So about halfway through the case, and I watch a lot of Law and Order. Does anybody watch that? I thought I was really prepared to do this because I'm a junkie for a special victims unit, and this did nothing to help me. And all those sort of big moments actually never happen in cases. But in this one, it did. There was an emergency hearing call by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, the, the uh, named defendant in the case. Your honorable, venerable sir, to the judge, it was a bench trial. The most incredible thing has just happened. We've just discovered, in response to two years, of demands for document discovery by the claimants. We've just discovered in Hanslow Park, which is nicknamed Spook Central, quote unquote, because it was the warehouse for all the MI5 and MI6 files. We've just discovered 300 boxes of previously undisclosed files packed up and spirited away at the time of decolonization in Kenya. And oh, by the way, sitting alongside of them are 8,800 files from 36 other colonies similarly packed up and spirited away. And we've been hiding them for the last 50 years. Oops. Now think about it. Without these five brave claims, it was the single largest document discovery in the history of the British Empire. And without these five brave claimants who came in front of the court, I was just a conduit. I provided them with the evidence that it was them that forced the hand of the British government. And that in the meanwhile, the British government had been sitting on all these files, sitting on all these files that proved these claimants to be correct. And at the same time, that same said British government was calling them liars. Because their form of evidence, their oral testimony, was not supposed to be as meaningful, as reliable, as important as what was in the document. The documents, of course, that they had cleansed out based upon this pattern of documents. That's a very long answer to your short question. <laughs> One of the things, there's so much there to unpack. One of the things that I get from listening to you is the interdisciplinary nature of this work. This is not just about a researcher or historian doing one, one discipline. You are bringing in history, you're bringing in philosophy, you're bringing in economics, sociology, psychology. Can you speak to the importance, like why were you, as a business person, asked to do the work that you were doing? Can you speak to the importance of the interdisciplinary nature of what we need to do going forward? Yeah, I'd love to. I mean, I think there's so much discussion about sort of this interdisciplinary stuff, and nobody actually really knows what it means entirely. Um, we're all, we always fight. You guys know my academic friends out there. We, we, we defend our turf like it's, you know. And, you know, the question again, sort of animating, as I'm lying awake, and I sort of back up that you speak here, the, the genesis of this book was the fact that I got done with the Kenya book at bore witness to these facts. Eventually the case happens and it all bears out and it turns out all okay. But when I was working on the Kenyan book, I couldn't, the point of that book wasn't the how and why question. It was the establishing of facts, right? And so I was just trying to, 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 to get at this how and why did this happen. And in the meanwhile, I had started this book not long after the first one. So this case is happening while I'm trying to sort of get some of the questions of the how and why with legacy of violence. And it was in that context that I learned of the scale. We knew, but we're getting back to knowing, we knew, but to, now because of the document release in the context of this case, one of the things they did is for the very first time, bear with me on this, they released the documents documenting the document destruction. 
So getting back to sort of the, the archive nerd that I am, for the first time we got the, I always imagined it as a haphazard process. It wasn't at all. So what I was laying out to in my initial remarks was the fact that they became better and better and better at destroying documents in a very, they went from the Independence Day ceremony to literally having schedules in Kenya of how long it would take to destroy three and a half documents in an emergency situation. And to cut to the chase, how long do you think it would take to destroy three and a half tons of documents? Three and a half tons of documents very quickly. Nine months. 24 7, nine months. So, if this is happening repeatedly throughout the empire, the question becomes as a historian, you can't, you can't, you know, how do you read ashes and fragments of evidence? You, you can't just, so you have to rely on other disciplines, right? That's one. So you ask questions like I laid out for you. How do we understand liberalism? What is it about the liberal project that enables these things to happen? Those are your philosophers, your critical theorists. How do you think about, and getting back to my recovering of investment bank, how do you get back to thinking about why the British have this policy of imperial resurgence at the end of the Second World War? Because we often think of, certainly from an economic exploitation standpoint, we see that sort of really at its height more in the earlier period, early 20th century. Now on this one, you have to understand currency and the sterling zone and money supply to understand what the British are up to. In short, they're in, they have a massive forex problem with dollars, paying back, servicing back US loans, and they are still hanging on very tightly to maintaining the sterling area. One of the things when we think about, for those sort of economists in, in the room, when we think about Bretton Woods and we think about the nature of the way in which we're moving toward the dollar zone, actually, the sterling is propped up for at least another decade plus. And one of the reasons why Britain wants to maintain its status as the world banker. And in order to do that, it's got to maintain its colonies, it pumps this money in, and then extracts it out. So there's not a single uniform currency in the empire. There are different currencies. And for example, if you are in Kenya, the shilling, typically you back a currency in Forex, in, in this case in sterling, 100%. That's like the worst case scenario. They were making them back at anywhere between 110 and 120 percent, which meant the central bank in, in, in London had a 10 to 20 percent window of extra, of extra currency to play with in terms of being able to service its own wartime debt, because as I said, Kenya was, uh, Britain was in the financial, uh, was, was bottoming out. And I'll pause there, but you get a sense that you have to be able to have these different things speak to each other. And in order to do this extraction at this kind of level, these wars become incredibly costly. And actually, Britain has a head start over the rest of Europe in the aftermath of World War II. Europe's decimated. So Britain doesn't have to innovate. Its, its factories are going. It's still supplying Europe with the rest. But Europe begins to catch up. And so in 1957, Prime Minister Macmillan conducts what's called the Audit of Empire. And he looks at it from both a financial, an economic, and a political standpoint. And from an economic standpoint, they could no longer rationalize maintaining empire because of these costly wars, number one. And number two, because all the able-bodied men, you still have conscription going on, are out in the empire instead of being back at home and innovating working in these factories. And this rubs up against their political desire to sort of maintain their status as part of the big three. But the point is, is that getting back to your different silos, you've got to break, collapse these silos down to understand. They didn't think, and how we do is dis in discipline, that oh, we're, we're going to think about like political scientists now, and oh wait, we're going to think about economists. Now. And anyway, so all these come together. And, and for an academic, it's, it was just a wonderful project to work on because it stretches you. I mean, they talk about a stretch project, right? I mean, suddenly I have to say my money supply thing, I had to dust that off a whole lot. Um, but it matters. And to understand in some ways to connect the dots in all seriousness, to understand why there's incredible violence going on in say places like Kenya or Malaya, you have to understand how currency works and how the money supplies work. And there's a connection between all of these. You know, and, and I think in that sense, that's why we also do have to really, you know, and, and also getting back to area studies. I'm an expert on Kenya and Africa. Suddenly I had to become an expert on all these places. And so the acknowledgments are nearly half the book because I have to thank all of my friends who read this, who are expert in these areas, um, who corrected me and saved me from myself on my mistake. <laughs>
thank you. We will turn to questions, um, audience questions and answers in a moment, but I wanna ask one final question. As we talk about basically the destructive effects on these colonial societies, these nations that were influenced by the British Empire, this, it doesn't end well. Or the story where they are at now is they're not doing well. Are there successes in the post-independence phase? Yeah, I think the, it's, um, it gets back to legacy, right, which we were talking about. And I think, look, you're hard-pressed not to see many of the hot spots of the world today that are not locations of former empires, right? And it's not just the British, but it is right now, many of which is, are, are in the, some of the British, the Soviet Empire. Um, and, you know, when we, when we think about the nature of post-colonial states, and I think about sort of, if you will, successes broadly defined, you know, I think about somewhere like, say, Botswana. Now, Botswana was Botswana land. Not, anybody been to Botswana? Yeah, okay. So not much happens in Botswana. Um, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty stable. Um, for a very long period of time, particularly during the British Empire, it was kind of that buffer zone between South Africa and what was southern Rhodesia, present-day Zimbabwe. But also, getting back to some of the points that I made in, in my remarks, Botswana is n almost 97% Swana population. So it is an ethnically homogenous country, number one. So these divide and rule tactics, these kinds of, one of the things that I, I, I would want you to, to sort of leave our day-to-day -day with thinking about is that the empire, not just the British Empire, but all empires, both engender civil wars and leave them behind in their wake. It is one of the things they bequeath to these nations. Now, Botswana does not have that because of this ethnic uh, homogeneity. The other thing is, is not long after independence, they discover diamonds and they're nationalized. So the wealth, the extractive wealth coming out of Botswana is not entirely going to Europe. It's being invested locally. So we have, and we're sort of chatting about this because you've been there as well. You sort of, I mean, you can't help but notice you drive from Zimbabwe into Botswana and it's like night. Roads are tarmac, there's schools, all these kinds of things. The, the other thing to bear in mind is I think some of the points that, that, that I've already made, which are when we think about these post-colonial states, the very constitutions, right, the kinds of laws that are on the books, that these are, remain on the books to this day. The ways in which we think about sort of what are, you know, oftentimes there's these kind of, kind of tautological responses, right? There's always been civil conflict in Kenya because Kenya has always been in conflict. Well, that's actually not right, right? And so when we think about this, and the question then becomes, how do we imagine, I gestured to this a little bit in some of my remarks, when we have these states that are, and I want to be very careful that we can't sort of look to colonialism for all the problems of current day conditions. What I'm talking about are the structures and systems that were left behind. So the question becomes, how do we think outside of that box? How do we think about, and even in some ways, when we see some of the collapsing of our own country, to, uh, the United States today, do you know what is the number one trusted institution in the United States today, based on surveys? The number one, like nowhere else is even close. What's that? Pharmacists. Well, I suppose it could be under this umbrella, depending on how you think about it. Business, number one trusted. So the question becomes, and this is tends, tends to the cascading, and you can sort of see this in different areas of the world. So the question becomes, and I gesture to this, what, it, what is the role of the private sector in, in collaboration with the public sector to addressing what some of these kinds of, uh, these big picture issues that we have? I don't, I'm not sort of, suggesting a magic bullet, but I think that we're going to be thinking about the ways in which the world functions going forward as being somewhat different than what our hopes and promises have been around governments in the past. And, and I think in some ways the global south, which has always been seen as tacking behind the global north, by global south they're kind of a code for sort of post-colonial states, behind the global north, we're seeing an inversion of this. And many of the ways in which we've seen things, infrastructure being developed, um, the, the uses, you know, sort of banking the unbanked, all kinds of things that private sector has been doing in the global south, we're more and more looking at in the terms of the global north of them leading this. And so when we think even about all kinds of things that are being addressed today, for the commons, the ways in which we think about society being helped by government is actually stepping into the breach more and more our private businesses on this. And I think it's, um, I, 
it's a, it's a new way to be thinking about things. Not necessarily a new way, but I think it's one that also addresses the the, the fragility, the the inheritance of of legacies of, of empire and, and colonialism. Thank you. Thank you. Questions. Dr. Elkins, thank you so much. That was fascinating. Um, I read Legacy of Violence, and I haven't read your other books uh, yet. Uh, but I have two questions. Uh, at least in the Legacy of Violence, you talk a great deal about um, military, political, economic devastation, and so on. But to my mind, the single biggest devastation that was, uh, that was perpetrated by the, co the colonial states is the destruction of the local culture or the attempted destruction of the local culture. Um, if you could, you know, talk to us about that and perhaps write even a book on that because and that's what we were discussing earlier on. So that, that's my first question. The second question has to do with, um, in the classroom you were talking about the straight lines being drawn in Africa. And, and to my mind, one of the things about the English is that, you know, they're probably one of the worst linguists in the world. Most English people have a great deal of trouble speaking any other language. And from my study, which is not even one hundredth of one percent of your study, most of the states that were split up were split up on linguistic levels, meaning that this particular area speaks this language, so therefore it must be a country, as opposed to other places where, you know, a tribe can speak four different languages because they're spread out. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bizet. And thank you again for allowing me to be here today. Um, your first question is, a, is, a, is an important one. In some ways, I get around it at this book, insofar as I, I am very interested in sort of the nature of physical violence as opposed to cultural violence, right? The ways in which the state enacts laws, and I, I don't need to rehearse, sort of rehearse all that I said. You're absolutely correct, right? When we think about the nature of, if you will, cultural imperialism, we'll stick with the British for a moment, this idea that everyone has to live in, you know, square houses and wear wool clothes and convert to Christianity, right? That the, you know, Weber and, and the, the, the capitalist work ethic around and Christianity and the, and so therefore what we see are a variety of imperial agents, actors within, but importantly outside of the state, particularly in the forms of missionaries, what we would consider today sort of NGOs, but this idea sort of the credo of David Livingston, Christianity, commerce, and civilization. And the code inherent in the, that notion of civilization is a very, not just Western European idea of civilization, but a very British one, right? And so in that sense, you're absolutely correct. And what does that end up doing? And we see an obliteration, and certainly within the, some are more resilient than others, but certainly even within, we see this in the Indian subculture. We see this everywhere going on. We also see sort of the, the, the inability, in some ways, the inability of local populations to respond to some of these incursions because of the frayed social fabric around these cultures. Typically these institutions that are supporting the moral economy, that are supporting the ways in which um, communities would typically respond sort of evaporating from that. So that's, hopefully it won't be as long, but um, if you've, in, uh, definitely, definitely an idea for the ne for next book. In terms of your point about linguists, two, uh, two things, an initial reaction, I couldn't agree with you more, and in fact one of the biggest problems with the British Empire was that you would send all these folks off and nobody spoke the local language. And so when you had this period of time that I'd sort of laid out for you of these various uprisings, their intelligence system, we always think of, you know, anybody watch James Bond, you know, MI5 and all of that, like that doesn't happen in the empire because they don't speak the language. They don't understand what's going on. And one of the biggest reasons why you have revolt after revolt after revolt is that these are intelligence failures. And they're intelligence failures because British population does not speak this language. And in some places, they have more success than others. But if you take the example of the Zionist insurgency that I gave you, it was unusual to get somebody within the Zionist community to take the side of the British, to translate or to serve as a, an intelligence operative. 
The other issue around this is, yes, I think in some ways some of the, the linguistic patterns does determine uh, the ways in which colonial boundaries are drawn, but I think also there are other times when, it, when they really ignore them and almost entirely. So, for example, when we think about those straight lines, the degree to which linguistic groups are divided, some, Cameroon would be a great example, right, in the areas of West Africa. Um, we can look down in the area of Angola and Southwest Africa, again, where we see these straight lines. And literally, you know, Ovambo speakers are half in Angolan, half in what is present-day Namibia, making absolutely no sense. And so there's often been ideas, get even sort of tying this back to some of the questions that Joanne was asking, there's often been this idea of moving towards federalism to sort of to create sort of larger states in contemporary society, in contemporary times, or at a minimum, um, creating these sort of larger economic zones that also allow for greater movement of goods and people. And we're certainly seeing a lot of success, a fair amount of success with that in, in East Africa, more than we have in the past, and in, in ECWAS in West Africa and Southern Africa. But they have a long way to go. And so, yes, I would agree that in some places we see some of this uh, mapping on. But in other places, it's another element to which we have very fractured and nonsensical nations having been carved out of uh, what was determined all the way back in the 19th century in, in Berlin with map makers and rulers. Rulers meaning, you know, straight line. <laughs> but thank you. I think we've got the uh, people with circulating. How has nationalism been like related to this? How has that factored into it? Because you talked earlier about the metropole versus the empire. I'm wondering, like, I know that this has affected the British nationalism, but how has it affected the nationalism of the groups in the empire? Yeah, I love that question. You know, I think one of the things, and um, that if we you know, when we think of many of these anti-colonial revolt insurgencies, they're often as much civil wars as they are anti-colonial wars. They become extremely complicated. So we, I could pick any one of them, right? We can look at Northern Ireland with Protestants and Catholics. We can look at Kenya, where we have divisions even within. So the Mau Mau emergency was predominantly a Kikuyu movement, which was the largest ethnic group in Kenya, approximately 20 plus or so percent. But within the Kikuyu, there were divisions between those who could be quite reductive, who were considered to be loyalist, those who were incorporated amongst the Kikuyu. There was no, it was not a, it was a, it was a society that was not based upon chiefs initially, right? It was based, based upon age sets and age grades. And so the British always went in to any society in, Ken in Africa and would say, okay, they wanted to rule, if you will, sort of somewhat indirectly through these, these leaders. And so they would go into local society and say, who's the chief? Well, amongst the Kikuyu, there were no chiefs. So if you're really smart, what did you do? You raised your hand, said, I'm the chief, and you were made the chief. You know, I'm sort of being written, but in part, that actually happened with some of them. So what happens in the, in the culmination in this post-war period that I talked to you about, sort of this sense of, of demands for self-determination, you have sort of what's considered this kind of loyalist community that is coming in part, but not in whole, from those who had been part of this, this chief system, which were sort of, which were in this case, really illegitimate rulers had to, who had been legitimized by the state. So when Mau Mau breaks out, the anger of, or the, the antipathy of the Mau Mau adherents is directed as much to the white colonial actors as they are to those who are considered to be loyalists. Hence, both an anti-colonial war and a civil war, right? And so many of the violent acts that initially take place in Mao, during Mao Mao, some are directed toward European settlers, but the disproportionate number are actually directed toward those who they consider to be loyalists. And when Mao Mao is being fought, those loyalists are then anointed as what are called home guards, and they become incorporated into the British security forces. And the way that you became a home guard is that you had to agree, you got a, if you agreed to actively fight, important, actively fight against your neighbor, you were given a loyalty certificate by the British government. And that loyalty certificate entitled you to relief from taxation, preferred access to land, and all kinds of other benefits, including not getting detained, right, as everybody's marched off to detention. 
So if you, you in Mwanlimi, wait, 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 no, you know this, yeah? And so to this present day in the Kenyan government, successive Kenyan government, the question about, so when independence takes place, these loyalists maintain a very strong hold in Kenya, despite Mau Mau accelerated independence, because of they had, had had all these privileges, right? And that they end up taking over along with some other moderates, but they end up taking over some of the government. And so they're embedded, they continue to this day to be embedded in the system. So there's this getting back to the civil war. So it's not even just between, say, the Maasai and the Kuku, but it's also within ethnic groups. And that would be, a, as, far, as far as illustrative examples, a great example of how divide and rule works, not just between these different groups, but also within sort of ethnic, and in this case ethnic, but I could sort of spell this out in sort of religious groups as well. Uh, there's a woman right here in the front. Up front. At the next part. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Hi. Hi. I have a quick question. Actually, it's, it's a... I'm a history student, Indian history, and I made a film called The Warrior Queen of Jhansi, and it talks about the, the struggles of India trying to get its freedom. And as I made the film, I realized that I was not just fighting the narrative of British history, mm. but Indian history by Indians. And I wanted to question it because when I normally speak, people say, oh, she's speaking without knowing much because I speak many Indian languages, so I had the privilege of reading Marathi, which was a vernacular language, mm -hmm. and the warrior queen was Rani Chasi, 1857, which the Western world would call a battle that she fought against the East India Company as a revolt, though it was the first war of independence of India, along with many others. And what I found interesting when making the film and getting a certificate even from the Indian government, they weren't sure if all my facts were right. And I did have Derek Jacobi playing the role at the end, saying every member of the East India Company will get the Indian taxpayers' money for the repartition of the war. This is a fact not known to most, or the fact that the Indian farmer could no longer use their land because once you plant indigo, that land becomes dead. So they lost the land. Or that the taxation of the fabrics and textile that we're still trying to renew the Indian sari and that China is now busy making co copies of it. The original textile and weavers of Varanasi no longer could make it because they were taxed for cotton and silk they grew. They took it, formed the... Western Industrial Revolution of Britain, they taxed every Indian product that would enter the country. So the Indians, finally, the Bengal market was flooded with 94% British goods. So everything that was destroyed in India, we still hear, the British gave them railways. No, we had everything. We had Ramanujan. We had the black hole theory. But most people in the West are still given the narrative the New York Times, the Washington Post, where they continue to call the, the Indian mind as something that was not sharp or didn't know what a democracy was. But it was the Kohinoor also that was again taken from India and is still not returned. So how does one deal with these war repartitions mm -hmm. today? Mm -hmm. And is this something that you could write as a historian for Indians who, like me, grew up in what we call Lutian's Delhi, very much the British education Cambridge system. But fortunately, I had knowledge of the Indian traditional world and could speak. Because my um, colleagues often say, well, we didn't read about this. Because as Macaulay said, to break the backbone of India is to break its heritage. So I'm one of the few people who speak Sanskrit and can tell the meaning while well, everyone else very well educated from Oxford and Cambridge, sit and nod and say, wonderful. And we only read the books of William Dalrymple or other Westerners. But very rarely will you read Sham Shastri, which is from South, or know that the Chola dynasty is 300 years old and is larger than the Mughal dynasty and was a longer period. So I know I'm going into many things, but I would love you to tell me 
How do we change that? How would you change the narrative that, say, a Modi government is doing things? And why is that seen in the West as so negative if he is giving back the Sanskrit for the land? Because that was the original language. So why is that considered, even by educated Indian Westerners, including my friends, as extremely right-wing? First of all, thank you for the wonderful question, set of questions, and also for your work. Um, be, truly, because I think the shifting of narratives is a collective effort of many. Many of us who will never, except for moments like this, have the opportunity, you know, it, it's happening in this kind of spider's web of things. And let me step back for a moment on, and make one or two observations, then come, come directly to your questions. As I explained a little earlier, in 2005 when my first book came out, it almost just destroyed my career. It disrupted things so, and it was a very engagé book. It is, right? It really, it really discusses, and I believe this firmly, that to discuss violence and loss, cultural violence, cultural loss, you can't use euphemisms. You have to have the reader understand and feel the pain of loss and suffering. That's one. And not in a kind of pornographic kind of way, but in a way that, that you, you just, that's one. But the dramatic backlash from that book, not just the right's predictable, right? Andrew Roberts in his history of the British speaking people accused me of committing blood libel against the British population with that book. 15 years later, this book comes out, and I was sort of braced for it, right? I have to get, I had a little bit of PTSD on the, on, the, on the critique of the first book. And nothing. It's, I mean, the predictable folks, right? But, but in, in so far as, and I don't want to say nothing, but it, it, it was the kinds of things I would have imagined and predicted on it, but, but reasonable, except for, the, I mean, the crazy right wing is still kind of off the right. But my point is, is that the narrative, the acceptance of talking about colonial reckonings, the acceptance of talking about violence, the acceptance of just facticity, of fact, that the facts in this book weren't being debated. It was the how and why did this happen that's being debated. That's a massive change in 15 years. Massive, massive change. This said two points. One, in terms of, of local governments, and this is sort of, I would be, I would be thinking pre-Modi, and in Kenya I would be thinking pre-Kabaki under, under, under Moy in particular. When I was doing interviews in the late 90s, Mau Mau was still a prescribed organization. It was illegal to even talk about Mau Mau in Kenya, based on what I was just telling you about with these loyalists. So I'd be, in the, sort of, if you will, the middle of nowhere in Central Province doing interviews. These very sort of uh, humble homes, huts, and everybody's talking like this because they're terrified. They don't want anybody to know. And in some ways, they're willing to talk to me because I'm an outsider. Wait, 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 no, 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 I'm an American. I would, sometimes I would carry my passport. So I wouldn't be confused with being uh, a European British person. That's one. Two, to connect your questions with my point about, um, you know, with my point about the left in response to my first book, people don't like disruption of narratives. They just don't. And official narratives are some comfort. And we think about sort of the, and it gets back to almost some of the internalization of, of colonialism. This idea that if Oxford and Cambridge anoints you, then you are truly civilized. Look at who's running the British government today, right? How do we explain this? How do we explain the battle that's going on in, in Britain today in, in governance? And, and most of these actors are coming, many of them, not all, but many are coming from empire. So I think this idea, and it's not to sort of just dismiss them as sort of, if you will, stooges or whatever the case is. It, it's, it's more than that. It's the internalization of this. It's the inter and the power of, of decades, if not centuries old, narratives about what defines civilization, the value of local indigenous cultures. And if I'd had more time, I had some notes speaking about just what was happening in, you know, not just the, the combination, not just the, the economic value, which was, 10x in the 18th century between the Mughal and, and Louis XIV. 10x it was worth there, economically. But not to mention the long history of indigenous culture, of languages, of philosophers, of literature, obliterate. I mean, as you know, Macaulay just dismisses them. 
There's not a single, what is it? There's not a single, you know, a single library in Britain is worth all of the texts written in the Indian subcontinent. That's what he had to say. 19th century. So, and I think in that sense, the, um, I think there's a, this is my, now I'm just speaking my own personal opinion. I think there's a fear of the global south. I think there's a fear of the global south and its role in the future in this world, which is enormous. India is no question a major player. China goes without saying. Parts of Africa, if anybody has read uh, um, uh, Declan Walsh's piece that came out in the New York Times about a week ago, looking at the youth bulge, one in four people in the world in 2050 will be from Africa. And he's explained this not in terms of the, the typical narrative that we see about poverty and the rest, but the influence that Africa is going to have. And so when we think about even the rise of populism, and we think about the rise of populism today in parts of Western Europe, certainly in the United States, it's a reaction to this, right? And some would say, oh, Modi's also populist. Well, maybe, but I think it's much, I think that's a very reductive way of seeing the Modi, myself, the Modi government. And I think it's a response to what is really a crucible of change. The change that's happened, as an historian, I love it, right? Because I live for change over time. Without it, I'm out of a job. But it's a, it's a, it's a, in a moment of acceleration around that in sort of these, these sort of crucial arenas, and many of them sort of a culmination of, of post-colonial societies. Anyway, you, as you can tell, this gap gets me going. I mean, I think there's so much to that, and I, I don't, I think that, um, that the, I think the kind, my hope is that the kind of conversations will be happening will continue to look like the 15-year change that I saw if we sat here 15 years from now, with some other really smart young person telling me all the ways that I'm wrong and you're wrong because they're taking what we're saying and they're running with it. Um, and that's the hope. Thank you. We have to end at this point. I'm sorry, this conversation could go on. The questions could come on. We could continue, but we are at our time. You've been, this has been fabulous to have this discussion with you to really look at the arc of the, the empire and its influence on present day. Thank you, Dr. Thank you.